Hi, everybody. Tina Brock, Producing Artistic Director here at the Idiopathic Radiculopathy Consortium in Philadelphia. I'm your host for Into the Absurd, a virtually existential dinner conversation. I do hope you'll join us the next 50 minutes. Sit back and relax as we explore the lives, the hearts, the minds, and the spirits of creators in Philadelphia region and around the world. And hello and happy October to you, everybody. Hi, I'm Tina Brock here, and this is Into the Absurd. And for the next 50 minutes, we're going to be talking with Liz Goldberg Johnson. And she is a illustrator and one of our most frequent guests here on Into the Absurd. This will be Liz's fourth time on the show, and I'm super excited to talk to her. I'm sitting in front of one of her amazing works of art, which are colorful and vibrant. She celebrates the diva, and she is a diva herself in the most wonderful sense of the word, in that she um, brings together so many art forms and people and collaborators. And we've been so delighted to talk with her over the 18 months that we've been here on Into the Absurd in different collaborations with different people. So today, we're going to explore uh, many of her, or much of what is on the table for her in the months to come. So we appreciate you being here with us and we look forward to your questions in the chat. And um, yeah, let's get on with it. Liz, welcome to Into the Absurd. Liz Goldberg Johnson. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Tina. I always uh, enjoy being on. <laughs> All so good time. to have you back. It's I so appreciated our friendship and artistic collaboration over the years that we've known each other. I think back fondly to when we met, Liz, um, when you had um, a show that was going up over at the Bethany Mission Gallery and Victor Keen and you and I met and immediately we found a, a, a way to bond over abs the absurd. And I remember you coming to the rehearsals for a production of Eugenie Inesco's The Chairs in 2016 and you sketched our work and it just came alive on the page in a way that was extraordinary to me as a director to see what someone uh, in the audience as a viewer with your kind of talent was picking up that energy that you were picking up in the script and uh, from what we were doing. So I've always, I've always so much uh, admired your enthusiasm and this, this sort of special, what you bring to the table. And um I just wanted to say that, and thank you for being on the show in many different iterations. Is in your work with Warren Bass is in animation in your latest project, Minifest. I mean, I wanted to have you on to talk about that. So, and that's that. That was just your recent, most recently completed project up very, in New York at Theater Lab, right? Very recent, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in fact. And uh, the Minifest in New York, it came about through. Uh, Orietta Crispino, who's the artistic director there and a theater artist in her own right. I just also saw a production of hers um, in the theater part. Uh, it came about almost like how we met. I was talking to one of my models and I said, I need to rent space to have this atelier. And <clears throat> the next thing I knew, I was introduced to Orietta and it just was a beautiful collaboration. She's an amazing director, the building, the theater, and I'm in the gallery section for my atelier, which I run, which I'm we're doing in a three week session right now. Um, and then the mini fest came about, she came down one day and she said, how would you like to perform in there? And you know, I'm an artist, you know, I, I, I love to, to talk and, expound but I'm not sure I'm an actor but she's no it'll be fine so we we went forth with this whole thing um it was extraordinary and through it I even collaborated with Rebecca San Andres who is the most amazing <clears throat> creator of bridal gowns and I went to her loft we picked out this gorgeous uh bridal gown my model Samir uh, wore it <laughs> and it became a gender fluid happening <laughs> and it was just it was it was like a whole theater production in itself so the mini fest was really um there were so many people coming through and it was a series of like 15 minute uh one act plays and everybody okay. had a different act that they were doing uh and orietta has a way of just bringing artists together than just mm -hmm. mesh. So I did one on how to become a fashion illustrator in 15 minutes. 
And uh, <clears throat> with a little bit of trial and, and error, um, I had everybody up and teaching them how to look like a fashion model, looking down on people, of course, really, really tall. So we all went through the, the motions to become a fashion model. And everybody got a pad and they had paper. And in 15 minutes, we all became fashion illustrators. Some people even brought their dogs. Right. I was so happy because that's a that's a accessory in New York that you can't live without. So I had a great time. I mean, it was it was something that then I got into it and really, really enjoyed because that's my forte to be able to draw really, really fast as an animator. Sure. And people were drawing. It was just wonderful. And then everybody moved on. We had people that guided people to the next uh, event and the next were, space. Mm -hmm. next space. I'm yeah. In giving you the the proper in, in 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 introduction that you so deserve, Liz, you know, I'm thinking because you've been on the show four times, and assuming right. that everybody who's with us today has seen you those four times, yeah. which is probably <laughs> highly unlikely, but yeah. we should say that you're an illustrator, and you com you combine many different worlds: film filmmaking, and animation, and fashion design, and graphic design, and you've taught at Pratt and Drexel, and you so you teach fashion illustration to people, and so you are using all of these different. Uh, every, skill set, every skill set one has but you know it's it's amazing because I think my whole life I've always been a collaborator I love class like when we met it was like mm -hmm. in collaboration without even and I think being in that mindset you have all these different people that become a cast in your play I have my models I could not have done the mini fest without my model Susan Mitchell and Samir, I mean, they're they're an integral part of my family. Um, uh, uh, Rebecca, who brought the the bride, we dressed him. To me, it's all the integration of that. When I work with Warren, Warren and I have worked for twenty years together. And we should say Warren Bass, who's your Warren Bass, your partner Warren in Bass, filmmaking and animation. Yeah, he's an independent, you know, filmmaker, former chair of Film and Media Arts at Temple University. So we've worked together for many years. Um, and the mini fest became an extension of the atelier. It was like suddenly I was part of a new family, a new world, which I loved. I mean, I just, I just love the theater world. Um, you know, I, I have a background in it, which I call with quotes. You know, my mother sent me to drama school for eight years, hoping something would rub off somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I. <laughs> I, I do think, I mean, there is something inherently sort of very theatrical about the work that you do and the energy that, that springs off the page. And, you know, I spoke earlier about your work in sketching the chairs and coming to that. rehearsal and how seeing those drawings and your, you know, your interpretation of that work that we were doing was mutually beneficial to both of us, me as a director, to see how you were experiencing it and that how that went through, flowed through your body and onto the page and how, um, and the feedback you could give us, you know, artistically from seeing it, but also from what you created out of that. Yeah. So I do think there's a huge part of you, which is in the theater world. And yeah. I know you've talked a lot about how animation has, uh, we've talked a lot about how animation has influenced your work, but I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that, um, Liz. Yeah, about animation. Well, you know, it's funny because um I went through art school <clears throat> I went through graduate school and it wasn't until after that and I'd always been interested in film from the very beginning silent film especially it wasn't until I went to postgraduate work in film at Temple having Warren almost you know as a professor mm -hmm. that everything finally gelled that the fact that I could draw fast I always thought well everybody has to be a portraitist and all I could draw so fast and I can see things turning in space without even thinking about it, that it was like a, it was like a, an explosion and all of a sudden everything went together so when I do the animations and it's really funny because we actually <clears throat> I do the drawings first it's like a sketchbook then the animation film comes together next it's not the paintings the paintings come after because after you draw a character five, six, seven hundred times, suddenly they're talking to you. 
they're having a full conversation. And I always, my my husband always laughs because a lot of us said, "Do you hear that?" And he said, "He thinks we're being broken into." I said, "No." I said, "I think I, you know, I think Shelly is is talking downstairs." <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, you know, my world, that if you draw these characters enough times, like the ones behind you, she was the original Cuban queen, mm -hmm. they become they become the paintings. They actually put together and then, uh, you know, work together with diptychs and triptychs of extending out who, who is talking to whom. Um, so animation really, it, it plays almost a vital central theme to my whole, my whole world. I think I see the world that way, you know, I, sure. I so, um, once that was discovered, you know, uh, the, I think my artistic world suddenly came together and then fashion, you know, fashion's always been part of everything because then you have to dress the characters. When I do an animation, I do them all nude. And then they have to dress. Then they have to dress. Oh, so, fascinating. So you yeah. draw them and then you decide what they're going to wear? Yeah, who's doing or what? Or do they tell you what they're going to wear? Well, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I just say you were in that. But it depends also on the animation. Like for Cuban Queens, it was all based on uh, pretty much the characters that I had done in my sketchbook. Um, you know, like I always have fun dressing you, you know, we're doing a portrait of you as we speak. And <laughs> in fact, um, you know, what, what she will wear. But I think that's part of um, the animation, I think, makes the paintings come alive. So I do it in reverse, actually, <clears throat> and then start again and, you know, start working on an idea in a sketchbook and then seeing what film can come out of that. So how during, during when you and I have talked about this, but I think it's, you know, looking back on the last 18 months, how were you able to, during COVID, continue your, your, your classes in illustration and how much of a, of an interesting setup was that for you? Well, that was very interesting because we were you know, the illustration classes, Zoom was an interesting, you know, uh, I'm not sure what to call Zoom. Um, <clears throat> it's almost difficult to teach any drawing classes, but we were teaching through that. And I found that <laughs> what I started doing was going into the building, you know, with mask and everything and having my, my easel behind me and actually acting to the, to, to the screen, but everybody was virtual. Mm -hmm. So um, I found it very difficult. I, I really did. I, I, I'm a live person. I love live action. But, you know, it's funny. Artists, artists just rearrange the pieces. Like I just rearranged. I started doing portraits, small drawings. Um, <clears throat> I, I just think I don't think I stopped. I don't know. I, 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 I we talked quite frequently during that time. And I know that yeah. you were um, that's what I so love about connecting with you is you were always yeah moving thinking figuring it out making it happen despite yeah. illustration probably being just I almost can't imagine how extraordinary <laughs> that must be and you did say you're working with students around the world right so there are many uh, yeah we were working <laughs> our, my international crowd that was coming on in china we were actually starting classes at 6 p.m and going over 11 p.m and i would just say okay turn your computer to the window. Let me see the sunrise because it was pitch black here and we were going all day and the sun would be coming up, you know, with air. Um, and I just think I, I think I try to make things theatrical, you know, think of it as a theater happening um, and just say, look, these are the pieces. How do we rearrange them in a way we've never done it before? Um, working live again, you know, going back, um, and we're meeting with artists like the mini fest was live. I'm working with another um, collaborator, Jane Jung, who uh, is assist this came about fortuitously. Uh, he's an assistant professor at Drexel in Fashion Design, and he has a retail line in New York. And it was just by chance that we started talking. I had him speak in one of my classes. And we're creating a line of magnificent evening wear, day wear, um, with my images on his clothes. These, I don't know what happens. These things come about. I think it's that I, I all my life, I, I've jumped into the deep end and just prayed I could swim. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think when I was growing up, like my father was kind of my, 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 uh, my coach. And I even being a, like being on the high dive at the age of eight, he said, just don't let any water go up your nose, you know, just point down. Said, oh, he said, don't let any water go, water up, your go nose. up your nose. And that was, that's all he gave me. Right. Well, I guess if you put your mind and you focus on that one thing, right? Yeah. It focuses it. You do the rest. You jump. And you hope for the best. And, and <laughs> you hope for the best. But I think it's, you know, it's the, I, I think it's just character development. You don't want anything to really stop you. Because some people were really stopped by COVID. And it was frustrating. I mean, it was very frustrating. But I always think of it as just a challenge because you don't have that much time on this earth to get everything done. If you're going to lose two years, you got to make it. You got to make it work. Right. You right. know, right. Uh, you were working during that. You know, we, we met. I remember that day sitting in the park. <laughs> it was about a year ago. Right. In October, we were out walking and trying to figure out ways in which we could yeah. and slowly I would out which portrait to do with you. Was like, right yeah. and we were we were working on we were, we had tossed around the idea of a live event that would incorporate your you know your your illustrations and theater and how that could happen in 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 covid or post covid you know and then yeah which yeah. i think i uh, can't i can't wait to make more plans about that now that we have a much better picture ahead yeah um you know, we talked recently, and I think the idea of, um, well, I didn't realize that during the last very heavy rains that we had here, you, you all, you and your and your home and much of your art was in danger of, of being lost. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the heroic uh, efforts that you and your neighbors yeah. and your husband yeah. took to? I have, we live in a condominium unit, but we woke up at four o'clock in the morning and we were in Venice in the canal, not near the canal. My, my poor car, <clears throat> big boy of 20 years, did pass away. He, he had served me well, but he was my favorite car. Um, we literally, I have never seen anything like this. We were under five feet of water on our street and the water is coming in. My husband and I started bailing water. We were bailing water and all our neighbors came in and we had a brigade. And we were, and they were carrying my my neighbor across the way. It was amazing. They were carrying paintings up over their head because my studio is down there and my gym is down there. And she was, they were just she was carrying the art paints that are on my table so gingerly, <clears throat> and we just kept bailing water for eight hours just to keep the water level at a foot in the basement. Uh, Did it feel like you're? <clears throat> I, I mean, felt this like is we going. Were, I was going to say, is this like your children or your aunt? Like, it just these things that were so valuable to you. So valuable, and you know, you know, I have a special bond with my treadmill, yeah. Harry, um, <laughs> who I had just paid off, and <laughs> I and and when all was said and done, you know, I just as a as a humorous part, he had a heartbeat, and I was like, oh my god, he had a heartbeat. Um, this but, is post. Post flood, um, he's back I'm to life. Tell you, I've never, we've never experienced, and we were carrying forty pounds of water up to the second floor, out the front door, and into the drain. And my husband, I've never seen. <clears throat> he wouldn't stop. I mean, he was just. We were bailing, and neighbors were coming in and just carrying buckets up. And I think that saved a lot of the. A lot of the basement, but um, it was traumatic. I've never seen five feet of water when you look out your window, and, and cars were floating down the street. They had the U boat. We were on the major street. We were on that street. Sure, that, that was hit by the, over, but, the overflow. But mine, I have to. I mean, I love my neighbors because, and we all got to know each other. But they were carrying those paint like up like this because the paintings are thirty eight by forty eight inches. Things were being yeah. carried up, uh, uh, portfolios. Uh, if you've seen the den, <laughs> it was like everything was like into one big. Well, I've been over, you know, to your house a, a number of times, and just how how much uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. art you have. I'm very prolific, you know. <laughs> so there was so much, so many portfolios that were sitting down there, and my neighbor across the way, Lisa, said, "You better get all of this now before it was mm -hmm. like it just kept coming in the garage, you know, like a wave." I, if you've never experienced a flood, you don't realize that it won't go. It just doesn't stop. And that wouldn't, the river didn't crest for eight or nine hours. Um, so it was, it was quite a, quite a happening. Decision. Well, I'm 
many yeah, we're, 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 kudos to you and your neighbors yeah, and, and your my husband to yeah, be able to bring all of your people to upstairs, to, yeah. to, to, to drier land. Yeah, um, yeah, and we're getting back. You see, everybody's kind of stacked up up here. <laughs> yeah, they're Pretty all waiting small, to yeah. be Go on the runway. Now. Yeah, going on the runway is right. <laughs> Was but, there anything during the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic, I should say, mm-hmm. recently, Liz, that you that you figured out any insight in terms of your own art or where, you know, did, did I mean, we all had, I think, you know, people yeah. talk a lot about of having like a lot of extraordinary insights into their own, their lives. And like you said, we, we don't have forever and we should focus that time and energy and make it count and do the things that we want to do. Was there anything specifically about the direction that you want to go with your art that, that changed or was amplified during the time you had to. I think uh, one or two things. One was the atelier. I just decided that I was going to do that no matter what. Explain what, explain what this is. The atelier was sort of came out of just wanting to open a space that people could come and draw and experience art in a way that you're not in any kind of formal setting. You're, and everybody gets individual attention. I had my New York models. And that was one thing that I had always wanted to do. And that that happened. Um, <clears throat> the other, I think, was just the portraits, you know, my portraits that I'm that I'm mm-hmm. working on. And also um, understanding how much fashion is intertwined into my pieces, like working uh, working with Jayoon right now with these wonderful garments of understanding how important, I think what I felt was the importance that I put on the art of collaboration. Mm-hmm. The energy that comes about when there are people that are all putting together that energy, and that's the part I missed the most at the beginning when we were really I don't know, quarantined or whatever we were doing. But one thing I did, <laughs> I would walk JFK Boulevard for four hours a day, thinking, mm-hmm. figuring out what, how I was going to restructure the situation. Um, and then the port, I always love portraits. I love people. I love to look at the insights. So doing a new sketchbook, because I have about 500 new drawings now of all, you know, you're in that, in that group too. <laughs> um, uh, that seemed to help and get the walking and thinking through it. And I have to, I think when I walk and I like mm-hmm. just keep, I, I think I'm just a, an animated figure myself and that I need to be in motion at all times. How um, did you substitute all the time that you used to? I mean, I, I remember us having conversations about, um, about uh, discoveries that you would make in the gym and no, right so did you substitute walking for four hours, you go? Four hours. Right. I got to know all the homeless that were along there we, they all had names uh four hours gives you you know you're burning your calories which is good that was my gym substitute until <clears throat> I could finally order a treadmill um and then so you know and then that kind of took over I find that I can think when I'm running I mean I I let my mind, it's the only time that um, I don't feel stress is that yeah. time. And I, I can let my mind just kind of float and, and let it connect, you know, free thinking, like free form thinking. And the, I know, you know me, I, I, I love to be in motion and walking. And I did miss, the main thing I did miss was the sounds, like the city sounds, like, you know, New York. People say, oh, I can't stand it. I love it. I mean, I love all the garbage cans and everybody. It's right? a like, symphony, totally. It's a symphony and a chaos that allows me to pick things out. I think it's theater of the absurd. In that, it's the theater of the absurd. If you're in that, mm-hmm. it's a wonderful world to be able to think. And so, yes, I did substitute the walking. <laughs> I look back now and I think I'm not sure how I did that, but it was a form of meditation. It's- oh, absolutely. I did a similar thing. It wasn't four hours, but it was definitely yeah. the same time. I mean, it was an attempt to put structure in there and also mm-hmm. to do, as you say, sort of let the mind free associate with what yeah. um, it was awfully a barren landscape there for quite, quite a while. Yeah. And just in terms yeah. of like those months where you just wouldn't see it. There just nobody was out. Nobody I mean, to think out. back yeah. on on how much time has gone on gone by and how I'm I'm very 
interested in how as artists, as we begin, you've been creating work, but as we begin to think about coming back out onto the stage and the works that we would like to tackle and how as artists, we will be changed in, you know, in ways that we don't even know right now. I mean, mm-hmm. to do, so say Tennessee Williams two character play, which is on the table for us, which is on the, was on the table pre pandemic. And now it is on the table post pandemic. And, um, but just how doing that, the thinking about that play, the direction of that play is altered now it, it, having gone through something that, you know, we, we never could have imagined and, 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 I think just, it changes. I think it changes our perspective. Like we change. It's like a box room that somebody just tilted. Because I know I have two shows now that were on hold for two years. We were literally getting ready for the show in New York, the Cuban Queens. I mean, I'd already ordered the the screen and all that was going to. And be this was a multi um, multi media media happening. Um, and now they're coming back in February and March, and it's that. You know, like you say, when the play is now on the table, there's that spark again that the, the characters come alive again. Like you, you know, you become three dimensional on the stage. Um, so it creates that energy again. But I'm telling you, I think everybody's altered. By it. I know I am. I, I look at things and I appreciate little things that I, I took for granted before, you know, of just I, even breathing without a mask, sometimes, you know, just of uh interaction again i think with yeah the, with the oh no yeah. no doubt about it um just having that 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 experience to sharpen what is important to you in your world the kinds of art that you want to consume the kinds of art that you want to make the way in which you would like to make it the kinds of collaborations that you'd like to have Mm-hmm. It's less at least it feels that way for me less uh sort of like you can get off the you know, get off the treadmill, if you will, for a second and say, okay, wait. So this, in a way, it feels somewhat like it did uh, for us anywhere for me. When we started 16 years ago, it's not the same feeling because obviously this whole, this whole uh, major change and shift in the way the world operates and what's important is, is in the middle of that. But in a lot of ways, it is like starting again. It is. There's a feeling, and a, you, you, I think you put your finger on the right on it on the pulse. And you do feel like you're starting again. And I found, you know, I was talking to some of my colleagues at Drexel. We're totally like dis- discombobulated. Like we know what we're doing, but it's like we never did it before. And I find in the art, you have to get back and get your schedule. Like you have, you really have to get your schedule back. It's mm-hmm. never. It's it's a funny thing, and I can't even put my finger on it. No, I totally. Like you're just starting. You have to. Elements of the structure have to be in place. I think yeah. the one thing that's really difficult, you know, in in speaking to that point right now is that, you know, I, I feel like I'm saying every week on the show, oh well, you know, the the pieces of the puzzle are coming together, and we'll have details for you soon. And what we took for granted, you know throughout this 16 years of just planning years ahead of time and knowing what, cause you know, you know what, just like the shows that you're planning, you know what, you have to know where you're going to be first. So am I going to be in a mansion? Am I going to be in a black box? And once you have that, what's the show that's appropriate? What's the experience we want to create for the audience mm-hmm. to fit with that space? And because there's all kinds of health regulations and things that have to be followed for both, you know, equity and just in general, right. you have to get those details straightened out first. But I hear what you're saying until you can get certain pieces of that puzzle in, the rest of the picture cannot be completed. And it, it is like, ah, you know, you're just... Yeah. have to wait for those pieces to be in place. There's just such a desire to to see what it's going to be like. And I think it's you're more aware of that than you are. Because as you say, we always planned ahead. Like, oh, yeah, I had three years. It's going to be here. This is going to be here. Now, it's. I think there's a bit of an intensity and an immediacy for it to happen, too, because you realize... You may have lost a couple of years. You you no, no, that. there's no doubt you lost a couple of years. You lost a couple of years. <laughs> Maybe you lose well, a couple of years. My, my uh, whole thing was I refused to have um, birthday parties. Right. I, I'll just take two years off. I'm two years younger. Here we go. Let's move ahead. I just, I said, just let's just rewind. You know, it's film. You know, it's like it's animation. Yeah. Rewind. Well, 
Yeah, but it's not. It's, but you're not. You're changed forever, it's changed, Liz. And really those changed. Yeah, I feel it, and I feel an immediacy that I never felt. I feel exactly what you're talking about. And that is, I mean, I used to hear an old oh, acting coach that Bob and I had many years ago would say, what are you waiting for? And this was 20 years ago. All right. So it's like, what are you waiting for? Get on with it, which is what birthed the IRC. But I hear his voice, God rest his soul. I hear his voice saying, what are you waiting for? Like, what are you waiting for? Get on with it, you know? And then you add to that, you know, what we've all been through. And it's like, yes, yes, it, it needs to be said. It, it wants to be said now. So I feel that I feel you, I feel where you're at. I think, and it's so interesting because not even seeing ahead, I know with working with New York, cause I've shifted a few gears, being in this new environment, which I never could even imagine, you know, of, of the theater, working with the theater lab and the people there, working with, you know, just working in the studio differently. My studio has never been so clean in all its life. <laughs> it did get washed out a little bit. Um, I find it's just exciting because things have happened that I didn't even know would happen. And I, I think it's because you took more, I took more leaps off the high dive. Mm -hmm. I, you know what? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It wasn't like it had to work. It was like, if it doesn't work, so be it. We'll start again. You know, it was like we didn't have, I think we've lost that preciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the innocent, yeah. Yeah. And sort of taking it for granted as well. Yeah. Like you do yeah. get on that tread and then your treadmill or, and then it's sort of like, well, you get into the administrative planning of it or whatever has to happen to make all of those things happen. But mm -hmm. at some point along the way, always that main question of, why am I doing this now? And how does this serve us as artists and also our audience? Well, that's that's what I'm looking at, even the show. Like Cuban Queens has been here for a while, but even Warren and I have talked about, you know, looking at it in a new way. We've, we've kind of regenerated that aspect and how it will move forward. We haven't started a new, I mean, I have a lot of drawings and a new animation is going to just pop out of that. But it's like to enjoy them a bit more. Don't don't rush. Right. But to like enjoy our, the process. Right. Right. And, well, and I, that's the main thing, the word process. I think we're, we're enjoying process more. Just because. making it, making the work for the sake of the work. Because that was, wasn't that what we had during this time? We had that, 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 that's, that's what we had really mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. us going was you know for us this this show the connection with the audience being able yeah. to be in greater communion with other artists in the community it was a, it was just a total savior i think we use zoom you i think you and i and the i think artists use zoom like once we learned it and, and i i i always give a hand out to to lee abraham <laughs> lee abraham who taught me zoom and, and kiko van Kluck, one of my models because i had no idea what was going on and using it as a tool for us to to connect you know coffee zoom you know zoom with coffee yeah, uh, yeah. to to at least keep a thread going because i think artists can't exist by themselves i think we get very lonely you know we get very upset <laughs> so and it did not provide opportunities. Let's face it, right? Whether I mean, even granted, the, the hours weren't probably what you would have liked. But to be able to, I think there's something very special about you know being in communion with somebody around the world. I just I don't know. We had guests on, you know, Vijay Padaki here, mm -hmm. um, who is you know in India, and we were able to work it out time wise. Obviously, you know, not yeah. not the I hardest thing in the world part. to do, but there was something exciting about yes, being able yeah. to yeah. know that you were, um, yeah. had access to. Yeah. Seeing the sun come up at, you know, it was six o'clock here. <clears throat> I loved being international. I loved having that once I understood how you could use it. Mm -hmm. um, but there was the part that I couldn't, <clears throat> you couldn't touch stuff, you know, like, you could, yes, sure. The tactile part is gone. It's flat yeah. in that regard. It does. There's a certain compression of it, mm -hmm. though, that I think this sort of focus. I mean, you, we've talked about this a lot, Liz, you know, you yeah. working, how exhausting, how exhausting it can be for if you're doing six, seven hours or however long it is you're doing. 
in this medium because you're basically compressing all of your energy into the screen, uh, you know, and, and for you being such a, you know, kinesthetic person and, um, you know, movement is a, is a, is part of your world, you know, I mean, it is mine as well. So it is, there's something exhausting, you know, mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. Um, there's a question here I want to toss out to you because yes. uh, I'm interested mm-hmm. in, in obviously interested in your, your, um, your, um, as you enjoy the process more, does that change the pace of your work or perhaps the number of layers in the work or that you put in the work? I, I think, um, <clears throat> I think you become more aware of the process where it might've been more just into, or you just went with it. Um, <clears throat> I found there was more of a concentration on the process. I, and, I totally agree with you. And suddenly, you know, and I, and, and I do talk to my students because that generation didn't really grow up with process. They saw the finished piece only. And I said, there's something about it that you're moving through time space when you're doing a process of things layering up. And that's, it is a layering up whole piece and when I paint finally when I get to the paintings there might be 13 layers you know some of the paintings have tremendous textures of this so I think I became just more aware of the pro of the concept of process of how we move through um and the layering up and enjoying it more like almost getting into the act of process right of, of doing it okay we have to have this for this production we have to have this for this show, this has to be done. It was like you could take a moment and just paint that same line five thousand times. You know, just oh, okay, try this. Just way. the meditative quality of like you know revisiting, or like I know when we were working on the beginning stages of this show, not a complicated show to produce, but you know you're you're uh-huh. experimenting with with what does actually work in this medium, what kinds of conversations are yeah. best are best had in this in this medium uh-huh. in this dimension uh-huh. what is the best way to use it and and simple i think is good in this medium although lots of very complicated and interesting things can happen um but i do think the to your point the 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 appreciation for the that process the learning what doesn't work the learning what does work and sometimes i think when we get into or i know this i'll speak for myself when we get into just getting the shows out and getting them up and getting them done there's this end line that you feel like you have yeah. to get to that is tied to finances and it is is tied to box office and, <clears throat> and now with i hate to say it but like with all of that kind of in question it's like what are box what is box office going to look like when we get back what are audiences yeah. going to look like when we get back we don't really know so there's really nothing to talk it to right now so mm-hmm. tie it to what you care about which is the thing and the reason you do it you know and I think you don't worry as much about a smaller audience oh I, I, well, I here we are I mean much more intimate in our audiences because uh, the people almost appreciate it more coming back and that was something I I used to think oh my gosh I have to get this and I have to get it now it's much more intimate and there's something about there's an intimacy that's come about that you really enjoy instead of saying well I have to have 500 people at that opening or my head will fall off you know (laughs) right (laughs) exactly so we that's such a great point Liz that we've come to appreciate if there's three people in the room if there's 10 people in the room if there's one person in the room it's a connection and it is and I do think you know when we first started as the IRC way back it was not unusual to have or I, I can remember snowy nights at the Walnut where, you know, yeah. people, tr- you know, came out in ice and snow and there would be five people in the audience. And it somehow felt very special because those people went way out of their way to be in the front row of our audience. Yeah. But isn't that so true, Liz, that it will, I think, change the perspective, at least theatrically for me. Um, oh, right. OK. You know, reinforcing this idea that, oh, this intimacy that we felt in this in this medium here doing uh, into the absurd mm-hmm. uh you can have that same intimacy i mean you I know think it's all across the board like the atelier it's it's a much more intimate group it's in and, and you you enjoy the process of that instead of worrying about loud l- large crowds it's i don't even know how to describe it but i've i've come to almost, uh, I don't know, like really uh, coveted, you know, of this kind of situation that I never thought about before. And as long as you're, I think as long as you're making art and you're thinking 
forward, you know, your this interaction, this collaboration, <clears throat> you don't worry about the end result as much right now. I mean, mm-hmm. I you do, but you don't. You worry about, oh my gosh, look at what I just created today. The yeah. moment that we're in, because we had so much time to sort of be in yeah. those moments, you know. Yeah. So you say you have a hard time describing it, but but take us inside. If I were to come to one of your ateliers, what would it what 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 would happen? It would be, <clears throat> they're probably not more than maybe just a hand, like a seven or eight at the most, sometimes a little more group. Um, well, I people. Have a mate, yeah, seven okay. people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can bring their dogs if they want. Um, I have the most amazing group of, of models. I have a family of models, Samir, Susan, Kika, they're my, my core. They come and they arrive and the lighting in that room is just tremendous. And um, I start out, I always have a, I always have an easel and I just kind of start out with a thought that I want to do with them. And I talk to my model what garments I want them to wear. And everybody, I, re- I tell them to be relaxed. You're, you're there to have a little bit more. What am I, so I come with my sketch pad and my pencil in hand. Guess, yeah, you come with your okay. sketch I bring a ton of supplies. I, I, I'm like, you know, the bag lady and I come and everything is there, but it's very structured in that I have maybe two points we're going to cover that day. You know, it may be proportion. It may be a tool, um, color. So I start out warm-ups. We do a lot of warm-ups. We talk about things. There's a, there's a, what is a warm-up in, in, a warm-up in your would world? A warm-up when the model is taking three-minute poses. And I talk about, and nobody has to be advanced. Everybody can be at their own level. And I kind of walk around behind and I kind of help and I say, you just elongate here, uh, exaggerate here. And I make it, um, I make it a theater performance and I also make it something that's enjoyable. You're there to see what happens on a piece of paper. And then, but I do have a structure. It's like a play, you know, I do have so, a structure. where. We're so going am to- I, when you're warming up with the models, am I sketching what you're doing? Is that the warm up? <clears throat> yeah. So it's a warm up for the, the people who are sketching. It's a warm up for the people who are sketching. And I always say it's like follow the bouncing ball. I'm drawing on my easel. And you can almost follow me as I'm drawing. I say, okay, now let's look at the neck. And I'm literally, and I did that at the uh, mini fest. <clears throat> you're actually watching my hand move in real time space. And you can just kind of follow what I'm doing. And I say, okay, we're dropping the body now. We're doing the arms. And <clears throat> the model is standing there. And by watching me work, I think it helps them to feel very real. So I'm not watching the model. I'm <clears throat> sketching what you're sketching. No, you're actually drawing the model, but you're looking back and forth. Oh, I see. Okay. Things. When you say follow the bouncing ball, you yeah, mean yeah, I'm I, going. I stand right next to the model. So I'm going back and forth between what you're drawing and what and the, the model, model is doing. And I'm trying to follow your reasoning for. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's. um. <clears throat> and when I was started the atelier, I had a lot of international people coming in. So we had Zoom set up mm-hmm. and we had my live audience and we had the model. So I would be talking to the, the screen and I would be talking to my, my, my people that were drawing. But it was live and there was something about the energy being in that room, whether we were masked or unmasked. And I said, you know what, there's no right way, there's no wrong way. And everybody started to relax, but it's all about figure drawing. It's all about fashion figure. Uh, it's all about the, the fashion model. What do we do? What are the elements of being a fashion model? And so I kept it very simple and I kept it a little humorous at times. And then I also bring tons of books. I bring books, <clears throat> I talk about certain artists, and then maybe I'll assign a student like that. Let's let's pick Toulouse. Why don't you try to find a few pieces of Toulouse? So it's a very Toulouse Lautrec, mm-hmm. and it's a very comfortable space. It's very brightly lit. It's very New York, um, and we're in the middle of the fashion district. We're smack in the middle. So a lot of times afterwards, we'll go as a group, and we became we become a group. Uh, so this is a class that you started during the pandemic and d- primarily who are your students in the class? Are they students from where you're teaching uh, at Drexel at Pratt? Or? 
I have the Pratt students, I have Drexel students, I have one of the curators, Helen Lee from the Met, who I had met in my travels. Um, we have uh, housewives, we have people that have come to the show. They said, I just want to come up and draw. I just wanted, I haven't draw, I haven't drawn in 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to draw. I said, come on in. It's it's an open, it's like an open salon. <clears throat> That you come in, you're comfortable, you know, we have coffee um, and you were drawing, but I have a game plan of what we're doing that one day. So they go home with a finished piece. Even though the, the mini fest, I was even impressed. Everybody went home with a drawing. In your 15 minutes, learn how to be a fashion illustrator in 15 yeah. minutes, part mm -hmm. of the mini fest that you do. Right, right. And I even had them get up and I said, look, we're going to look, we're going to be that model. I said, you have to elongate your neck <clears throat> so they could actually feel it in their body that if you elongate your neck and you look down on everybody with a haughty attitude, you're one step closer to being a fashion model. Uh, you pop a hip and then you feel that you're two feet higher than everybody else. <laughs> Uh, when and you just, say pop a hip, I'm just <laughs> I didn't mean to pop the hip. <laughs> you literally pop a hip. Thrust the hip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> pop a hip. I know what you're saying, but it and just uh, it kind of loosens everybody up that it's like an aerobic class almost. And then we right. sit down and I say, now we're now we're now we're all fashion models and we're gonna start to draw. And I keep it simple to line, a little bit of color. We don't go into extensive things unless somebody is very advanced and then I push them. Sure. And everybody's working at their own speed. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think is is the biggest, um, the biggest obstacle for, uh, for, for, for people when it comes to drawing? Is it, is it just the same thing that it is for most artistic things? Mm -hmm. And it's just like checking yourself or being too much in your head or yeah. not trusting the process or. Yeah. Not what? being in the character. Like I know if I had to act in one of your plays and you say, okay, you're going to be this character. I'm petrified. I got stage fright coming out the wazoo. Like I remember as a kid having to play the fairy godmother in Cinderella and it was a disaster. <laughs> I mean, I really wasn't cut out for the part. So what happened? You just became self-conscious or? Very self-conscious. And I really couldn't let myself go. You, you know, you, you, you have to make people feel relaxed. Enough that, you know, even if you bomb, it's okay. So, you know, it's, it's that feeling. I think that I try to make everybody say, look, everybody can draw. If you can put a line down with a piece of pencil, with a pencil on paper, you can draw and most people are afraid that the work is sloppy like it's not neat I'm like I haven't used an eraser in 30 years I don't even own an eraser I use my finger and I just rub the page I say you know what it's line it's lines and marks on a page and we're going to make a figure out of it you know it's like we're going back to our childhood in a way you know where we weren't so <laughs> conscious of well, you as you're speaking of this I'm I'm remembering when you say I haven't used an eraser in however many years it just took me back to I've been watching <laughs> This is something I do when I'm just like need a space. Bob Ross, you know, I'm on like PBS watching Bob Ross. And I'm like, well, how did he get like, okay. And he just doesn't, there's a confidence about just like, I'm making this, I'm making this mountain. I'm making this cloud. I'm doing yeah. this thing right now. I'm like, how did he do that in 30 minutes? And it's the same experience I had 30 years ago when I was watching Bob Ross. And that's like, how does he do that? I always watch him too, and I'm like, how the hell did he get? But you know what? When I was a kid, and this is a story that's so funny, when we moved to Miami, because we moved all over the country, my father's job took him all over. I went to the Connie Gordon School of Art on Lincoln Road, which is now very shishi in Miami. She was upstairs, and I went in, and she literally was a Bob Ross. And my father was standing in the back. My father was a really very good coach. He was standing there. And I created a landscape that was really quite beautiful because she said, okay, now the sky, three dots, all white, three dots of red, two of blue, and, and some of yellow on the bottom, crisscross, crisscross, and rub it in, sky. <laughs> that was my Lola. last, that was my last <laughs> class with Connie Gordon. <laughs> I, and I look where. <laughs> and I still have that landscape. It was it's it's a formula. It is a little bit of a formula. But do you, do you not also think, Liz, like the body, getting the body to just like, as you say, I haven't used an eraser in however long. I'm just going to make this cloud. And like, I'll watch him, you know, Bob, Bob Ross make a line and I'll think, how is that going to be a mountain? And then all of a sudden, it you know, beautifully, he, he, I don't know, with a palette knife and a, and 
a yeah. cotton ball. It's a mountain, you know. He's, he's I mean, done it a lot of times, but he did have to come up with the first way of doing it. But there is a formula. There are formulas. Believe but it you also not. have that confidence of knowing that you can go in. Like there's just something about the fluidity with which it, and we can, you know, that's another conversation about yeah. whether you value the art and the art is really art or whatever it is. But there is just this like definitiveness about I am going to place this line and with this palette knife, I'm going to do this thing. And it's a thing. And, it and is. it's and like, it's, it's going to be good. Yeah. You and know? some artists, oh my God, I can't draw. <clears throat> this looks terrible. I said, no. I said, you put a whole figure down on that page. You fit it all on. It's a start. And then, see, I have ways that I take the student. <clears throat> we do like overlays, tracing overlays of taking it to the next point. We don't start again. We go on with it. But um, I think it's allowing yourself, like if I had to play that fairy godmother again, maybe with help from you as a tutelage, I think I could do it now because I don't have that self-consciousness I had at 12. Right. Where, I mean, but there's tools too, right? Like you yeah. come into a studio and you have a lot of tools and on a day, I mean, there's your mental tools, your emotional tools, but there's right. also just your, your technical tools that you use, your intention, where you're putting your focus, you know, <laughs> all of those, those, the framing devices that you use to kind of get yourself in the space to create right. the thing. And then you rely on your instincts and <laughs> your sixth sense and everything else that you well, bring. That's the whole thing is you do have the tools. I come no matter what, who's coming. <clears throat> I come from a, with a bag full of goodies. I mean, everything from paper to marker paper to the to paints, no matter what. And, you know, also expose what I do in mind is expose people to that. There's no one process like there's mixed media that, you know, there's look at all the different ways you can put the puzzle together. I mean, I always like puzzles. Didn't you like puzzles as a kid? And I was like, oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Just, I mean, isn't that what like art is and creating art, art and making a life of art is just this mm -hmm. giant puzzle. Yeah. And we talk about that a lot is we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. We'll have it together soon. Yeah. And you really can't release, you can't get to building that next part until you find that one piece on the table that you need mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be able to go to the next place. And that is part of the challenge of That's it is where is challenge. that piece that I need yeah. right now? And sometimes it's annoying, you know, because you, you, you know it's there. And then when you find it, you say, my God, what took so long? But it's hard. Like, I always like, oh, my gosh, I could have had a V8. But it took three months to figure out, oh, if I do that. But it is part, you have to enjoy, you have to be up for that. I think art is very, because people want things or theater like immediate. You can't. Like I always say, I've been in this business like over 30 years and you, you know, we. I look back now and I say, <clears throat> I feel much more comfortable about exploring and not worrying as much. But on the other hand, I want fabulous pieces when I finish, but it's, uh, it's a different, you're more comfortable. Well, it's 10,000 hours too. I mean, of whatever it is, you know, those, yeah. that counts. I, it just I think it matters counts. and it yeah. is important and it is, I mean, you get those hours somewhere, but you do find, and I think it became particularly um, particularly specific during the pandemic that, right, so what are the tools? What are what did I learn in those 10,000 hours before that could serve me now mm -hmm. to help me navigate this yeah. Alice in Wonderland kind of thing that we're in right now, both emotionally and also just to be able to put that creativity somewhere. Right. And it is an Alice in Wonderland. I think you touched on it. It is. And you've got to be willing. I, I, that's one of the, you know, like I do an assignment in my freshman class and it's an Alice in Wonderland assignment because that's a, that is, you have to be willing to tilt the world a little bit, you know, and, um, and then we're tilting it. on top of tilting, right? I mean, now we're, we're like, doing, yeah, we're, I, I really feel that there is a, you know, a feeling of uh, discombobulation in a, in a positive way, you know, that you're finding your way out of that, that whole thing. But I think it, as you say, you still need to have built on those 10,000 hours. You, you have, you just can't jump in. Um, you can, because a lot of people have said to me with the atelier, and by the way, the atelier is going on for two more weeks on Friday, 10 to 1 up in New York. And so if, they go, uh, if everybody goes to your website, they can they find, they yeah. can find information. And I think Bob posted the, the um, yeah. 
And, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, but mm -hmm. the thing is, is that, um, you can be rusty, but you can start, it's like a start point for people. They'd say, Oh, I just want, you know, and it's a little start point that might lead to something else. Um, you know, it's like a tour guide. I, I really feel sometimes like I'm a tour guide. Like, you know, I wear this orange bracelet and I remember step right and I'd go, everybody follow the orange bracelet, you know, stop looking at your phone, look up because there is a limousine coming and they will hit you crossing the street. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, you're you're almost like a tour guide of leading someone like even in a play of leading through an experience they they may never yeah. have had before and they leave feeling like a different i think they leave feeling like a different person you know it's that for sports or uh, well i do i mean that's right i mean that yeah, is that i is think awesome. one of the ba the great things to come out i mean great is too too big of a word but one of the one of the results i think is it feels like people are rethinking these very valuable experiences and connections and the kinds mm -hmm. of things, what they want to do with their time, their finances, things are changed all over the board just in terms of that's just goes without saying. So it's like, where am I going to put my time, my energy? And a lot of new directions feel like they are happening for people experimenting with things, trying things that they, and whether it's that that sort of being very aware of time and the amount of time that that exists for us or the fact that we lost two years or and lost so many people and things mm -hmm. and you know all of that feels like it's aggregating together and yes. you feel like the perfect fairy godmother tour guide to lead everybody on that crazy bus um yes. Liz That's a you know <laughs> I love that visual yeah, I, I do the like you've been on the front of the bus up with these visuals but that is a perfect visual I mean can you imagine all right everybody you no know, you need to do a bus tour Liz of I, I don't know something and be awesome. like <laughs> sketching on the bus or I, I think I, that I, would be fabulous and we could make like a little like I used to always figure out where I was because you know I always have many things going I used to say if it's Tuesday it's Belgium you know just getting myself centered but I would love that would be a I would love to <laughs> Liz, Liz yeah. Goldberg, the tour guide. In the tour their guide. Next That's my next, my next, my next, uh, my uh, next, very animated in a way. <laughs> you know? Very. Well, there is no shortage, Liz, of, yeah. of like ideas, uh, of ideas that, that seem to pull together all of these multi facets of your artistic life. And I just want to thank you for, I could talk all night to, to you. It I is know, six o'clock in time for dinner, yeah. but yeah. I have I, appreciated so much the time that you've given us over the last, uh, you know, 18 months being here uh, and being on the show sure. and just sharing. And I value very much our meeting at the Bethany Mission Gallery, our introduction yeah. through Victor Keene and just the ways in which we have uh, be, been able to share the things that yeah. are so important. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure. You don't know. I mean, it's, it's a very mutual thing. And uh, I, I am so happy to be on here. It just it excites me. Well, you'll be back. Um, okay. We're, we're gonna we're gonna be transitioning the show into a kind of a little bit of a different um, a different event, which I'm going to talk about in just a couple uh, of seconds. Uh, right. But thank right. you, Liz, so much for all you're doing, your energy, and um, I look forward to collaborating with you in the future on on more work. Me too. All right. Thank you. So take much. care. All right. Take care. Thanks. And thanks to you, our audience. And uh, as you are hopefully all on our on the IRC's mailing list, you probably have uh, been getting our emails over the last to get the links to these shows. And we are transitioning into the absurd uh, from our once a week place that we have so enjoyed being here with you Saturdays at five. It is now time to focus our energy on getting back on to creating work on the stage. And that puzzle that I spoke about earlier in the show is the puzzle that we're working on right now. And we can review to you that those playwrights that were on the table um, last year, Tennessee Williams, the two character play, Enda Walsh's The New Electric Ballroom, Samuel Beckett's All That Fall, these are plays that are still on the table for us. We're just finalizing some details about when we'll be back on the stage and where we'll be back on the stage with you. And it, it very well could be March of 2022. It might be June. Um, these are, are, are what we're, this is what we're working on right now. But what we're going to be doing is using Into the Absurd, Have No Fear, um, as a way of saying, uh, uh, keeping in touch with you and using these works that we're going to be creating, and as well as other companies around uh, the city and around the country, to go backstage and to talk about how we make the art and use the sort of post-show conversation 
session in a virtual way to be able to introduce you to that work and find more about the artists and the creators that are making that work in a way that hopefully will illuminate it. And if there's a show that you just can't make it to, you can still find out a lot about what's going on with that show by way of Into the Absurd. So if you stay tuned to your email, we are going to be doing pop-up into the absurds uh, for you. And we definitely want you to save the date for Saturday, December the 18th at 5 p.m., our regular Saturday slot when we'll be doing uh, Sonia Robson and I uh, will be doing an adaptation of August Strindberg's The Stronger, which her husband, David Robson, has put together and Sonia has translated. And so we'll be here Saturday, December the 18th. You'll hear more about that. This will be at five o'clock. It'll be a virtual um, production. And then hopefully from there, we will be looking at when we will be back on the stage uh, with you with some of our favorite authors. So to everyone who has been on this journey with us over the last 18 months, it has been extraordinary. You have just been more than we could ever imagine. And I want to thank you so much on behalf of everybody here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to bring, uh, to, to, to like unmute the cameras, Erica Holscher and Bob Schmidt, who whose work you see on the IRC stages all the time. Erica doing a lot in the way of costume design and Bob, you know, certainly um, doing all of that other work that gets these shows ready. These are the two that have been flying the plane literally un unerringly for the last 18 months. I think we've, I don't know you guys, how many shows we've only, I think we took a couple of weeks off during that time. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't have done it without you both and just enormous appreciation to the audiences, but I, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm super sad and we've talked about this a lot, but uh, excited to see the ways in which we can use this, um, this space to do greater things. Um, so I'm just going to let you guys add any thoughts, um, you know, that you might have, or just, you know, well, I just wanted to thank everyone um, that's uh, tuned in, you know, um, for joining us and helping us um, keep the IRC alive in this way. So thank you. And look for us on stage. soon. Everyone's name come through the registration. So I hope to see all those names uh, eventually in person and, and meet everybody face to face. Yeah. Thank you, Erica, so much for hosting the shows. And Lehigh will continue to host our shows. I, I think there's a lot of exciting ways in which this virtual medium will be used. And kind of the fun part about it is we'll pop up when we pop up and we'll let you know in our email. So if you see an IRC email pop up in your inbox, know that we're up to something. So just mm -hmm. check it out. We'll also be going back to our sort of traditional way of registering. We had a lot of questions. We've been, we should also say happy ending to the Fringe Festival here. It's been really hard the last two years not being on stage since since that's where we started Bob Schmidt back in 2006 as a you know as a as a company it's been just utterly so hard not to be in the fringe but we'll go, be going back to our way of registering and uh so that you'll you'll sign up and then you'll get the link and whatnot um that is uh, sort of that's that's the way we'll be, mo be moving on um, in this regard. But uh, yeah, so from everybody here, I love the I love the backgrounds that you all have chosen. It's just utterly absurd. I, I get so verklempt, Bob, when I see the gallery and just how how much we grew as a company thanks to the generosity um, of of. Uh, Victor Keen and Jean Ruddy. And uh, to you, Erica, uh, you're in some long lost place that every IRC. Place. Where are you? I'm in a spooky Gothic castle. Well, it's perfect for October and it's just where we need to be. Right. We need to be doing Kafka in that place. So um, I'm excited to get back out on the stage and to, and to make all of this happen. So um, to everybody, thank you so much for everything you've done to keep us here and just keep Keep looking for those emails. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. We're finishing up the final uh, the final stages of the new website, which we will have out there for you very, very soon. Hopefully, Bob is working on that. We've had someone else design it, but we're just finishing up on it, and it'll hopefully make things a little bit easier. I like to think of our the website that we have currently as being like a great antique shop with like a million and thousand rooms, but it's really hard to find your way around it. So... Um, hopefully this new and improved website will make your experience uh, a little bit easier and hopefully as, as fun and eccentric as the IRC is. All right, everybody, enough from me. Thank you, Erica Holshore. Thank you, Bob Schmidt. See everybody very soon and save the dates. Yep. Saturday, December the 18th for The Stronger. Have a great week ahead. Thanks, everyone.